we are here today to talk Docker lingo. We're here to talk about some cool Docker lingo. Why are you ad-libbing? Hi, I'm Solomon, and this is my assistant Merlin. And we're going to be talking about Docker lingo. Or not. <laughs> what do you think this is? Uh, a company. What does a company do? Whales? Oh my god, what is a container? These are all the things that we do with containers. We build them, we share them, and we run them. We work on share. Pants company. Khakis are nice. Docker, we get complaints from customers of Docker's, the pants. My dad as well. Oh, your dad as well? Yeah. yeah. He complained. I just gave up trying to explain it to my parents. They just asked me how to fix, like, the router. Kubernetes? Kubernetes. The campground in Big Sur. <laughs> Container orchestrator and is now open source. We also package it up in UCP. And what, what is it? A Greek word for... Greek for helmsman? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see our next one. Do you want to pronounce it and see what you think it means? Uh, Kubeckle? E, what about you? Kubeckle? 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 Uh, Kubernetes deployment or something. Maybe it starts a Kubernetes thing up. Kubectl is the CLI that you use to control Kubernetes. See previous answer on Kubernetes. Uh, I, I'm coming off as way too egotistical in this. <laughs> okay, I always mess this up. Is it Azure or Azure? Azure. Azure. I say Azure. I say Azure too. Yeah. Ooh, I know what this is. Yeah, do you CNAB. know what CNAB is? CNAB. I do know what CNAB is. Cloud native application bundle. Bundle or build? Build. I think that's the stock trading symbol for United Cannabis. <laughs> Feature creep. Creature feep. A what? I thought it was like my manager. He's like always creeping <laughs> over our shoulders, <laughs> making sure our features are in. So I creep. Yeah. yeah. Feature creep is when you put too many toys in the toy box and then you make a mess. The buses and trains in New York. Yeah, that's it. That's the only it. acronym I know for MTAs. Modernize your toys automatically. Modernize. Ooh, good. Traditional. Yes. Applications. Ding ding. Mayonnaise, tomato, avocado. Mayonnaise, tomato, avocado. Uh, schwang. 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 You want to take a swang at it? <laughs> swag. Swag? Swag. Swag. I got some lit to swang at the uh, recruiting fair. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't say that with a straight face. Is this, this supposed to be an acronym, I assume? Oh, software engineering. It shouldn't all be capitalized then. <laughs> what? S wait, what Sprank it? Sprankle? Sprankle? Sprankle pod? Next. Sprankle. Next. <laughs> no. Yes. This is a thing. This is not a thing. <laughs> it is. What? I tripped over my sprinkler. This is a brown M&M. Like, who put this in here? And I broke my pop. <laughs> you know this is going to appear on main stage, right? We'll have to go ask Steve what this one means. I don't know. We made that one up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, no. Get out of here. Sprinkle pot. This is messed up. I think it's funny. So, you guys figure it all out. Are you ready to fill out your applications for our intern program for this summer? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, everyone that actually understands what Docker is says it's completely powerful. So change their life. Yeah. And pretty soon sprinkle pods. No, never. That's the next never. big thing. That's never. It. Okay. Please welcome Docker CEO and Chairman of the Board Steve Singh. Good morning. <laughs> We're really excited to have all of you here. Thank you all for joining us at DockerCon. We're going to have an absolutely great week together. By the way, there is an amazingly diverse set of tracks and sessions that allow us, frankly, to share some ideas, to learn from one another, to hear about new projects. And of course, you're going to see some amazing demos, and we want to share some new products with you as well. I encourage all of you to dig in deep, get the most out of this week, have a lot of fun, by the way, as well. Everything we do at DockerCon, everything we do as a company, is, is, is designed to help you and your company build incredible products and to increase your rate of innovation. That's what we're about. By the way, DockerCon, and frankly, literally our company, 
wouldn't be possible without the work that we all do together as a community, without the participation of everyone. And so with that, I want to thank our sponsors, not just for your sponsorship of DockerCon, but frankly for your partnership. Together, we're ushering in a new era in which software becomes the heart of every single company, where the developer and the operations team take center stage in every single business. So thank you very much. I want to set the stage for our product, our customer, and our partner announcements. And also, I want to set the context for how we're expanding our investments in both our platform and also our community. Look, six years ago, we bonded over this very simple but powerful idea. Let's change the way we build, share, and run applications. Docker was able to take this ingenious concept of a software container and make it simple and make it accessible. And frankly, the beauty of simple ideas, particularly those that deliver significant value, is that they change our reality. They enable new opportunities. To imagine the power of containers, all you have to do is to look at any shipping port. The physical sh shipping containers that dot the wharf, well, they were the core ingredient that made global commerce possible. And around that container, an entire platform emerged in the form of machinery to load and unload containers, to manage them, secure them, and move them across oceans, countries, and city streets. And almost overnight, goods once available only in certain parts of the world became available everywhere. And what were once small markets became global markets. And frankly, port cities like San Francisco became major drivers of economic growth. All of that started with a single standard, the shipping container. Now, you all know this. Each of us are benefiting from and we're driving a very similar transformation within our own industry. As applications are refactored or they're written anew in a world of cloud and edge computing, containers are that basic unit or the standard upon which all this transformation is occurring. In fact, just over a month ago, Container D graduated within CNCF. It's just the fifth project to graduate, following Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, and Core DNS. So with a thriving ecosystem, a formal governance process, and a strong commitment to community sustainability, as well as inclusivity, Container D is being used in tens of millions of production environments today. It is, in fact, the container runtime for the industry. It's also an essential upstream component of the Docker platform. And just like the shipping container, our focus on creating a formal standard for software containers was driven by a very singular goal. Let's enable innovation on a global basis, and let's see what happens. And that's frankly what we're seeing. At its core, that's being driven by the incredible adoption and growth of containers and container platforms. In fact, by next year, more than 50% of global organizations are going to be running containers in production environments. Not just playing with them, but running them in production environments. And over the past year, Docker deployment sizes have increased roughly 75% year over year. No matter how you look at it, containers have become the de facto standard for application development. And this is happening for a really simple reason. Containers and container platforms deliver incredible value. They dramatically increase the rate of innovation. They materially lower the cost of running applications and managing those applications. And they enhance security. But it's also happening because of you, an amazing community of customers, of partners, and open source contributors that are frankly innovating across boundaries within our community, within the Kubernetes community, the serverless community, service mesh, storage, and frankly, the list goes on. I'm really happy to, to help uh, to, to, to uh, let you know that the Docker uh, product suite is also expanding materially, both our community products and also our enterprise products. Docker Desktop, which is the most widely adopted tool for building container-based applications, 
grew more than 100% year over year. Nearly 2 million developers use it to drive innovation cycles. We continue to invest very aggressively in Docker Desktop, both our community and our enterprise products. And you're going to hear a lot more about our investments in Docker Desktop when Cal and Scott and the rest of the team join us on stage. Docker Hub, which allows you to discover, share, and frankly monetize your innovations, serves up more than a billion containers every single week. And there are 5 million applications sitting in Docker Hub today. And these numbers are going to, we think they'll double over the course of the next year. This is all happening because container platforms are now the mainstream for how you build applications, how you share them, and frankly, how you manage and run them. And of course, all this is enabling incredible opportunities. But when you talk to developers, one of the things that's really clear is that this is just the beginning. In fact, earlier this month, Stack Overflow did a, a report. They surveyed 90,000 developers. Docker ranked third in the most used platform behind Windows and behind Linux, which frankly speaks to each of you. It's the pervasive nature of the work that you're doing. It ranks second in the most loved platform. And look, I, I love the first two, but I also love the third. It ranked first in the most wanted platform. It's always interesting to see where people are actually working and where they want to go. And I know I speak for all 450 of my colleagues at Docker, and I know I speak for our community in expressing our gratitude to see how our platform is driving great value. When Scott joins me on stage, you're going to hear more about the the investments we're making to decrease or to improve the time to Docker, to help those in the most wanted category <laughs> and the most loved category. That sounded a little wrong, the most wanted category. That to help those in the most wanted and the most loved category move to the most used category. So look, if the answer is containers and container platforms, it's logical to ask, what's the question? What's driving this massive interest and adoption in container platforms? Well, over the past couple of years, I've met with hundreds of CIOs, CTOs, and chief digital officers. Every company is dealing with the exact same issue, digital transformation. They want to know how do you leverage the public cloud? Is it an all-in decision on one cloud? How do you leverage differentiated services of each of the clouds? How do you drive down costs? How do you in increase the rate of innovation? That's the conversation. And digital transformation is a priority because it, frankly, that's what it takes to compete. And that's what it takes to win new customers. In my view, within the next decade, you're going to see roads talk to cars, trucks, and even bicycles. The concept of air traffic control is going to come to city streets. With your permission, your, your car, your home, your health devices, things like your, your watch, frankly, your Peloton, your clothing, your shoes, they're going to negotiate your insurance rates through your actions. Your bank, the one that you choose, is going to have a real-time view on your income statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement. Financial products will become completely and utterly customized to the person or the business based upon where you are in your life's journey or the journey of your company. Now, we know this because that's what our clients are doing. Look, it's simple. Innovate or become irrelevant. Now, I know that that sounds a little bit negative, but it should also be very exciting. Because more and more, differentiation is driven entirely by software. And that means you, each of you, you're at the heart of your company's future. In fact, last year, job postings that included Docker skills, that required Docker skills, increased 50% year over year. That speaks to the demand that's out there for you. That speaks to the opportunity. Look, as an entrepreneur, I love seeing the endless stream of startups that are enabling a lot of these innovations. And you could argue that over the past 40 years, Software innovation was largely driven by technology companies. But we're also seeing amazing innovation coming out of some of the biggest companies in the world. And I firmly believe that over the next 40 years, 
you'll see more software innovation coming out of that 85% of the global economy than you do from traditional software companies. From all of you that are driving digital transformation within your companies. Look at Docker. We have the pleasure of building a platform to help you build, share, and run all that innovation. And that's what gets us excited. That's what's fun about our company and our opportunity. By the way, in those customer conversations, there were consistent themes that emerged. Companies that succeeded in driving digital transformation and in building, frankly, incredible innovations shared three attributes. First, they leveraged their unique assets of their business. Now, that might be their product, that might be their market reach, or frankly, their cultural ability to disintermediate their own business. Second, they deliver new, delightful, and comprehensive customer experiences. In fact, the very best companies deliver these products and services long before the customer asks for it. And third, they transform their business model. Increasingly, the new products that are being delivered are not just an extension of the existing business model, they're the foundation of what their business model might look like in the future. And by the way, this process at all these customers is never a serial process. It's iterative, it's dynamic, so you can learn and adjust in real time. We're lucky because we have a bird's eye view into all that innovation. In fact, we're blown away by the innovation that our customers are driving and how they're transforming their businesses. Today, to start our conference, I want to recognize six companies that are setting the bar for innovation and value delivered to their customers, of course, using the Docker platform. So let's roll that video. Please join me in congratulating Visa, Carnival, Citizens Bank, Nationwide, Lindsay Corp, and Mutual of Omaha. I'm sorry, Liberty Mutual. I so sincerely apologize. Look, I want to congratulate them for the innovative work that they're doing and thank them so much for being our customers. In fact, what I'd like to do is dig in a little and hear about some of these transformations. So please join me in welcoming Todd, Sharon, Eric, Brian to the stage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being our customers. How are you? Wonderful. Great. Yeah? Good morning. Great. So hey, look, um, as Innovation Award winners, I want to ask each of you a few questions. And in your first question, perhaps you can set the context uh, for your uh, business. How is technology impacting your industry? How is it impacting your business? And, um, and, and that'll help our, our audience really understand the work that you're doing and, and why that's important. So, so, Todd, let's start with you. Right? What is the Ocean Medallion system? And why is it a priority? How are you building it? Yeah, so, you know, one of the ironies in the travel industry is that everyone wants to talk technology. And the real value is actually creating experiences within the travel industry. And you see a lot of travel industry players using technology to di differentiate and then compare product features. But customers expect more in their engagement 
uh, with their travel company. At Carnival Corporation, our focus is to provide a very personalized, customized, and streamlined experience for each and every one of our guests. And we do this through our guest experience platform. And this revolves around the Ocean Medallion, which I have here wearing. And essentially what that does is empowers the next level of personal interaction. The Medallion Class experience amplifies your vacation by providing personalized services that can anticipate all of your needs, wants, and desires. You know, the Ocean Medallion powers many Medallion Class experiences. And some of these are allowing our guests to get ocean ready. And what this does is essentially eliminates the very first friction point at a terminal by allowing our guests to go direct to ship versus standing in uh, long lines at the terminal. We also have um, keyless stateroom entry, eliminating the need for uh, a cruise card. We have wayfinding on the ship with turn-by-turn -turn instructions, right? So on a ship, at sea, moving, and being able to find wherever you need to go. We have shipmate locator, which is essentially allowing you to be able to find all of your friends and family while on the ship. We have hassle-free payment. We have gamification and um, anywhere on the ship wagering. Of course, this also includes Medallion, Medallion Net, which is our best Wi-Fi at sea. And then I think, you know, really my personal favorite, and which is a real game changer in the, the um, travel industry, is personalized service anywhere on board for whatever you need. And, you know, one of the, the important pieces with all of this is, again, the personalization that is unique to each individual. Additionally, we also combined live entertainment and shows to make even a much more powerful immersion experience uh, that includes storytelling. Fantastic. So before we go to Sharon, let me ask one more question. You have, um, you've got about 10% of your ships now running the system, right? Talk to me a little bit about what it took to actually build this and, and what, what do you see as far as the opportunity to say, how do I differentiate even further? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, essentially a cruise ship is a mobile city and it has everything that a guest could need and want, including lodging, hospitality, transportation, banking, communications, recreation, and entertainment. And what this does is it gives us the unique ability to control the entire guest experience by connecting all these elements together. So Docker's platform uh, provides a very critical role in our guest experience platform, which is deployed to all the ships. How we ultimately deliver a medallion class on a ship is, you can essentially think of it as, we digitally wrap a ship with our platform that then allows us to deploy any and all experiences in a very ubiquitous way to our guests. Fantastic, fantastic. Sharon, you've obviously um, led a very uh, uh, impactful you know, um, cultural change uh, within Citizens Bank. Perhaps you can share a little bit about the, the initiatives you're driving and, and how you're driving those initiatives. Certainly. So before uh, Franklin American was acquired by Citizens Bank last year, um, Frank, we used to talk about ourselves as being a technology company that just happened to be in mortgages. So it was always a critical factor uh, in the business. So when my boss was hired a few years ago, he wanted to ignite innovation. So he said, let's just go ahead and create a team. And he asked me to run it. So I looked at the opportunity to actually create a startup inside an existing organization, so the quintessential entrepreneurial uh, experience. And I knew that if we were going to actually deliver a product to market for ourselves or uh, outside the industry, um, I needed a cross-functional team to operate uh, independently. Excuse me. So. <clears throat> 
part of getting established, though, was creating a platform from which we could operate. We had to have that base foundation in place in order for us to start to innovate. Yeah. And we knew we wanted containers as a critical component of that strategy, right? And to deliver on a microservices architecture um, and doing the whole continuous delivery, Docker fit the bill for us. We had quality of service requirements, and um, we executed by creating a platform built around your technology. And the first thing we did was try to look at a key, critical component within our, our business and reimagine it. So not just recreate it for the new technology, but look at what the business actually needed today. And along the way, we had some opportunistic moments um, present themselves to actually demonstrate the power of what we were able to put in place. For example, we worked with a division within the organization that we were able to take a concept from idea to production in a week. Wow. Unheard of. Uh, we were also able to integrate with one of our vendors uh, in a, just a little over a month, which we were the fastest integration ever. Um, and then we've been able to extend the paradigm beyond just software and into our data operations. So it's been a fantastic look at transformation from a whole different perspective. That's incredible. Are you seeing that, that approach kind of take, uh, uh, take hold in the rest of the business? Absolutely. So we're starting to be sought out for to, uh, to work with. Um, actually, we had a Citizens hired a, a new enterprise CIO recently, and he came and visited and spent some time with us last week. And he's very excited to, as he sat and talked to everybody and watched some of what we were able to do, because he's like, so you deliver every couple of weeks? And we're like, we actually deliver several times a day. And um, he's excited about taking what we've done and expanding beyond home mortgage. It's, it's amazing. And, and it, even though it sounds simple, the reality is, that being able to drive innovation multiple times a day is still relatively new in most uh, large organizations. And so it's amazing to see some of the success. Brian, you and I have known each other for a bit, and um, I, I love Lin Lindsay Corp's story. Um, and in fact, the first time we met, you told me, hey, look, we saw ourselves as a manufacturing company, but then we transformed into a software, firmware, and hardware company. T tell us why. Why was that important? Why are you doing this? What's, what are you trying to drive? Thanks, Steve, for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, on behalf of the whole Lindsay Global team, you know, I'd like to thank you for, for the award this morning. And I think to the question you just asked, that's exactly it. I mean, Lindsay Corporation started as a very humble manufacturing shop in the small town of Lindsay, Nebraska. Now, over the course of the past 50 years, uh, the business has, has evolved considerably, and, and it's now a global operation with sales and operations in more than 90 countries around the world. Three primary businesses. Uh, those three primary businesses are our core ir agricultural irrigation business, our industrial IoT business, and our transportation solutions business. And today, the core thing that ties all of those businesses together and is really powering the growth that we're seeing today is technology. <laughs> and so I think the question is, how did a company go from being one that primarily specialized in bending and welding steel uh, and serving uh, the agricultural market to one that is really leading in technology across three different you know, global, uh, uh, global solutions? And I think the answer, you know, like all things at Lindsay Corporation, is it starts with the customer and it's driven by the customer's needs. And, and take the agricultural side of our business, for example. Our FieldNet and FieldNet Advisor uh, business uh, and solutions uh, are helping farmers in multiple ways. But I'd say the two primary things that it does for farmers around the world is, one, it helps them uh, make better decisions to manage their uh, their operation more profitably. So they're applying only the amount of water that's needed just when it's needed and only in the amount that it's needed. Uh, and the second piece, and the piece that I'm probably most proud and excited about, is the global impact that that's, that is having today and will have in the future. So with FieldNet Advisor technology, the water savings that farmers can realize is, is substantial. And we're committed to helping farmers save more than 700 billion gallons of water 
and more than a billion kilowatt hours of energy over the next three years. And that's really just the start of what this technology can do. That's amazing. In fact, one of the, the things you stated uh, or mentioned at a, when we had dinner was that the, apparently the, the water that's available for, really, for irrigation is, what, 1% of the water that's uh, on the earth? Is that, is that roughly about right? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating stat. I mean, if you think two-thirds of the planet is covered by water, right, you would think we have plenty. Well, the reality is 70% um, of that water is, is unsuitable for human consumption or plant consumption. And of, uh, actually, 97% is unsuitable for human consumption. Of the remaining 3%, um, two-thirds of that is frozen in ice caps today. And so, of that less than 1% that remains, today, two-thirds of it is being used for agricultural production around the world. Now, that's critical because only 18% of the uh, farmland globally is irrigated, but that 18% produces more than 40% of the global food supply. So it's critical, but the challenge is today it's only being applied about 50% efficient in a lot of places. And with FieldNet, FieldNet Advisor, you can take that 50% substantially higher and drastically reduce the amount of water that's being used. That is amazing. Eric, Nationwide is all in on cloud. Right? And given that it's a Fortune 100 company, that's a big decision and it's very impactful. Help us understand why. Yes, we are. And we've been talking about it all morning, a digital transformation. Cloud's really just only a part of that digital transformation. Um, we are moving from a traditional mutual insurance and financial services company into more of a technology-driven company that sells products and services. Um, we are focused on our members. We are a member-owned company. Our members make decisions for our company, and we want to provide services to them that are frictionless and seamless. So we developed a cloud-first strategy. We're migrating a majority of our applications to the cloud over the next few years so that we can leverage containers, APIs, microservices, which will actually allow us to benefit in ways that we've never seen before, such as innovation, uh, the speed at which we can deliver new releases to our applications using a cloud-first strategy um, is an awesome benefit. We're also um, focused on agility, experimentation, modernization. So moving from our legacy monolithic applications into modernized services allow us to meet our members in new ways that we never thought were possible. That's incredible. Hey, look, one of the things that I found really fascinating um, in, in learning more about our relationship with you um, is that you first started using Docker five years ago, yeah. right? which is, that's incredible. Right? You think about how early Nationwide uh, engaged around what was at that point just a cutting edge uh, piece of technology. And then I, I think uh, you mentioned that, um, that your go forward uh, approach is all apps have to be in containers. Is, is that, the, did I capture that correctly and why? Yeah, I mentioned a cloud first strategy, but things are changing so fast that that almost sounds legacy now. So <laughs> we, we talk about things like maybe we have a containers first strategy or a microservices first strategy or an API's first strategy. Um, but yeah, we are heavily involved in developing our cloud platform, um, Docker being a catalyst um, to help us um, launch those applications into cloud. Fantastic. So I'm gonna ask each of you just to jump in uh, on, on when you think about the emerging technologies that are important to you, that you're thinking about uh, leveraging, what are they, and, and perhaps even why? Todd? So, you know, I, th I think the um, continued advancement and, and AI with IoT and connected devices and, and how they're deployed and integrated together. For example, at, at Carnival Corporation, we're doing this today as part of the medallion class experience. When a guest enters our experience IoT um, ecosystem, all of their needs, wants, and desires can start to be anticipated. You know, additionally, from a technology side, <clears throat> service availability is critical, right? You wanna uh, make sure that all systems are are operational not to impact that guest experience. And uh, we do that through self-healing and a lot of proactive um, operations, always keeping the guest at the center. Fantastic, sure. Sure, so we're in the data business, so it's obvious that artificial intelligence, machine, and deep learning are gonna play an important uh, and continued value uh, proposition for us. 
I think blockchain is going to enter um, because of the provenance and sanctity of the data and the importance of the decisions. But I think probably for me the most interesting um, technologies coming into play are augmented reality and virtual reality. I think home buying is going to become an incredibly personalized experience and uh, I think we're going, to be, we're going to have some fun things to, to work on. Fantastic. Brian? You know, it's interesting. People you know, talk about a lot of these different technologies that are impacting their industries. And, and we have a unique set of challenges in, in our primary agriculture and our industrial IoT business in that most of our IoT devices are installed in very remote locations. So while 5G might set the world on fire in the next five years, the reality is it's not going to be a benefit to us. And in many places around the world, we will still be relying on a 2G, maybe a 3G connection. So, the abil so our devices in the field have the ability to connect a massive amount of data. Our pivots can go around the field every single day, capture images of the entire field, essentially scan the whole field, but we're limited. We can't stream all of that data to the cloud. And so the technologies that are going to most impact our business is really going to be the intersection of edge compute and artificial intelligence and deep learning. As we process that on the edge, you know, look at images of the crop to not only identify the presence of a bug, but to be able to say, is that a ladybug or is that a harmful Japanese beetle? And things like that that provide immense value for the farmer, but it's got to be processed on the edge and then, you know, parsed and, and communicated Fantastic. Eric? There are so many, and I've heard several of them mentioned on this panel this morning. A couple that I would add is around robotics processing automation. Uh, we've seen a, a huge adoption of that across our company, um, looking at things like cloud native services, managed services, how can we um, automate um, the manual work that we're doing today. Um, the other a uh, piece that I would call out is around security too as well. I think there's a lot of opportunities to automate around uh, vulnerability management, data protection, um, things like that. Um, the speed of change is definitely a challenge when it comes to culture. Um, we're constantly learning new skills. It takes a while to learn those skills. And then once we learn those skills, we're asked to learn something else because we've moved on to a new technology. Um, so that's something that we're all constantly facing. Um, Nationwide takes a unique approach where we're not only just continuous learners, um, but we're also looking for folks that are continuous teachers that can multiply that knowledge across the organization and help us along that uh, journey to deliver business outcome and create value value for our members. Fantastic. Look, four incredible leaders that are driving massive change within their, their organization. They're going to be here at the conference. I'd encourage you all to, to track them down and learn more about their stories. Thank you so much for joining us on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. They're not just incredible leaders, they're incredible people. And I really encourage you to, to track them down and, and engage in a conversation. There's so much you can learn from their experiences. Look, I wanna thank all of our customers, all 750 of our enterprise customers who are running their mission critical applications on the Docker platform, and the millions of users of our community products. Many are here at this conference, they're sharing their experiences, their insights, and their guidance. Thank you all for being here. Because you just heard, Docker is being used to migrate applications to the cloud, to modernize legacy applications, frankly, the applications that run your business, and to develop next generation applications, and to develop applications that actually live on the edge, that enable things like entertainment, that feed our societies, you just heard from Lindsay Corp, and that frankly power our cities. Our job at Docker is simple, deliver a platform that allows you to build, share, and run your applications anywhere you want, so you can transform your businesses. And the way we do that, by the way, is to build our products with a couple of very simple principles in mind. First is simplicity, and the second is choice. Those principles were foundational to Container D, and they're foundational to Docker Enterprise 3.0. Our goal is to simplify the complexity of technology, whether it's the complexity of creating a container or managing a set of Kubernetes clusters across multiple clouds and, frankly, edge devices. 
our tools and platform should be accessible to everyone. And the, the breadth of features that's within them should make themselves available as you need them. But simplicity also extends to how you share. Not every piece of technology needs to be reinvented. If there's a great piece of functionality that, that does something like funds transfer, you ought to be able to leverage that and say, hey, you know what, this is from a trusted developer. This has got a high scalability rating, a high rating from a developer, and be able to use that as you build your applications. Right? That allows you to leverage the genius that's everywhere in the world. Our customers also have a broad range of skill sets that they operate with. Different um, uh, programming, programming languages, different ranges of experience with, within their engineering organization. They have different processes. They have different requirements on where they run their applications and how they run them and how they manage them. A great platform takes simplicity and choice, puts them together in a way that allows you to achieve your goals. The, at the end result, is very simple, right? You ought to be able to build your applications easily. You ought to be able to run them, manage them, and drive incredible value. In fact, our principles are fundamentally rooted in the same principles around the internet, right? Interoperability and choice. Look, um, let's scroll forward, guys. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I think you're going to find those principles of simplicity and choice. Those principles, principles will be at work within what you're going to see next, which is Docker Enterprise 3.0. But before we show you that, and before I, I ask Scott Johnson to join me on the stage, you all know that at Docker, we have a, a tradition, right? Our, our conferences are obviously live, our demos are live, and uh, there's always an offering to the demo gods that, uh, that we, we provide. A little good luck never hurts. So I wanna make sure that I do that. Oh, this is beautiful, it's a shipping barge. And with that, I want to welcome Scott Johnson to the stage. Scott's the general manager of our enterprise solutions group, and he's going to walk you through the next generation of the Docker platform. Scott? <laughs> All right, here's the homage the developer laptops, stickers on developer and system and laptops, Sprinkle Pod. It might be a thing. It might be a thing. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for coming to DockerCon and spending time with us this week. We have a great week planned for you. Hope you enjoy it and dig in. Um, just as a show of hands, who was here at the very first DockerCon 2014, five years ago? OK, I can see some of you in the first couple of rows. OK, everyone pay attention who raised their hands. Now, for whom is this their very first DockerCon? Raise your hands. Excellent. Thank you both. Thank you both. Everyone who just raised their hands, find the first group, right? They have all the lessons learned in the scar tissue of the five years, and they've been contributing as a community early and often this time. Thank you both. So as you heard from our panel, there's a number of challenges our customers face in digital transformation. To quickly delight customers, respond to competitors, optimize their supply chains in real time. They want to ship faster. In fact, 72% of organizations say that application delivery speed is the number one criteria for development success. Next, they want to have the flexibility to meet their business requirements, their technical requirements, in any deployment environment that they choose. And increasingly, that's in a hybrid multi-cloud world. And then, they can't have the, fast two, the first two. They can't ship quickly and have flexibility deployment and sacrifice security control. They have to have security control in doing the first two. Now, since inception, addressing these customer challenges has been the North Star of Docker Enterprise. It's Docker's enterprise container platform for end-to-end -end application delivery, providing organizations with all the functionality they need to build, share, and run applications on any infrastructure. And we're honored that 760 enterprise customers trust Docker Enterprise to give them the speed, choice, without sacrificing security. And Docker Enterprise 3.0 represents our next generation enterprise container platform. 
with new functionality to help you go faster, take advantage of an even wider range of choices, all without compromising security. So in terms of what's new, first up, to boost developer productivity without constraining developer choice, Docker Desktop Enterprise. To harness the power of Kubernetes without its complexity, the Docker Kubernetes Service, DKS. To lower the friction of shipping and the friction and tension between developer and operations when it comes to building, sharing, and running multi-container apps, Docker applications. And then, as we see customers increasingly accelerate their, their transition to cloud, they want to consume their container platform in the same fashion that they consume their cloud infrastructure. And for that, we're very pleased to announce Docker Enterprise as a service. Yes, thank you, thank you. Now, now, knowing this crowd, we could give you another 100 slides on all the uh, features of Docker Enterprise 3.0, but I guess what? Would you rather see a demo of Docker Enterprise 3.0? Yeah, right? All right, so please join me in welcoming to the stage Harish and Clarissa. Hi, you must be Harish, the DevOps lead. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. I'm Clarissa, the new developer from the Lannister Corp. I know you've heard of the former CTO, Tywin Lannister. We always pay our debts until we don't, hence why we wanted to get acquired. Well, welcome to the bright side, Clarissa. Thanks. Well, now that the Lannister Corp has been acquired by Westeros Industries, Scott mentioned that I should come speak with you since you know how everything works around here. That's right. I typically wear a t-shirt that explains the exact job that I do in the company. So, I fix stuff and I know things around here. My team and I set up most and manage most of the infrastructure over here. We hold doors to production. Cool. Well, I've joined the innovation team and have been asked to help set up um, a new application with Docker. Cool. Let's see what your requirement says. Yeah, so I got this post-it note and the App requirements are one, write it in Java, and two, use Spring Boot. That's a lot of requirements. Oh. <laughs> and on a post-it note, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty typical. Um, at our, my last company, my entire department participated in a six week long training lab to learn how to write Java Spring Boot apps for a proprietary PaaS. So I'm pretty familiar, PaaS, sorry. So I'm pretty familiar with how to set up a Java Spring Boot app. Six week? It's a lot of time. It's a whole season. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty frustrating. I had to follow specific rules for the platform we had. It really cramped my style, you know? So first step, we'll need to get our VM farms and load balancers working correctly and set up the platform. That took us a few weeks at the Lannister Corp. Uh, so since that's going to take a while, I guess in the meantime, we'll start retraining our devs on the rules to follow when writing the apps so they'll run when the platform's ready. Brace yourself, there's going to be some pushback there. Wow. That sounds like a lot of work. Here at Westeros, we believe in keeping things simple. As of last Sunday, winter has come. So as developers, you simply need to focus on only writing code, complaining on Twitter, and going to Stack Overflow when you get stuck. <laughs> Not learning a whole new methodology. And that's why we just rolled out Docker Enterprise 3.0. It actually has a ton of great features that lets you get quickly started. For example, to begin with, it comes with Docker Desktop Enterprise that has an embedded application designer, which can help you a lot. It lets you create a new Docker application project that automatically generates all the files that you need to build, share, and run the application. And guess what? You can leverage custom templates to also enforce organization policies and best practices. Let's take a look. So Great. go to the Docker logo there. 
Great. And click on Design New Application. Okay. Click Choose a Template. I like this UI. Yeah. And I see that there's a template already for um, the Spring Boot app, and it's conveniently titled DockerCon. Yeah. I told you, we like to keep things simple. <laughs> and as you can see, it also uses the official certified images from Docker Hub. Please yeah. click on that. OK. And you can see that everything is already populated. The ports, the backend, what version to use. Nice. Now you can just click Continue. OK. Now let's give the app a proper name. Um, homage to the rightful queen. Let's call it Kalishi. Kalishi. I don't know if I like her. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> there you go. OK. See, it's building. I'm going to run the app. Yep. So as you can see right now, the UI went. It picked up all the files that you need. And now it's actually building the Docker app in the background. That just gives you a template. Now you can actually go use the ID of your choice and make whatever modifications you want. So let's click on that. And there you see. All the files are already populated. Everything was generated now. You have the Docker Compose files, the parameters you need. Docker file was generated, all the ports, configures, everything is there. Nice. So let's check back on our application template, see if it looks like it's up and running. And I believe the front end port was 8080. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whoa, I can't believe how quickly it was we, we took to set up this app. Got it running with Docker. Wait, where are the elephants? There were supposed to be elephants. You'll have them in version 2.0. OK. Oh my gosh, Harish, I also, <laughs> man, I just realized there's another side to this post it note with the app requirements, and it says run on Kubernetes. Ah, <sighs> Kubernetes. That's what everybody wants these days. Man, so I guess we'll need to set up a cube cluster somewhere. At my last company, we would make a request for a test Kubernetes cluster, and that would take around four to six weeks before we would be able to get access to one. No, no, no. We got you covered here, too. Docker Desktop Enterprise that's installed on all Mac and Windows 10 laptops inside the organization already has a local instance of both Swarm and Kubernetes running. Let me show you. So let's close this app in the UI. OK. And let's shut it down there. OK. And, and if you go to the CLI. OK. So it's built in. Oh, it's already built in, like you said. So you were checking me? Trust but verify. OK, so now let me show you how easy it is to install the app. Do you mind? Go for it. Cool. So let's think it called it pretty easy. Okay, so you have all the files here. So all we need to do now So now we're going to install the app yep. because you said Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. We chose Kubernetes. So now this is going to go pick up the stack, take all the files that's necessary, and it's actually going to go create the Kubernetes deployment, the pods that you need. And I think it's up by now, so let's take a quick look. Okay. There. You see, all the pods are up and running, all the deployments are ready to go, and the ports have already been configured for you right out of the box. Whoa! <laughs> so I don't even need to worry about setting up my own local Kubernetes cluster? That's right. Also, you don't have to worry about your dev environment being out of sync with your test or your pre-prod or your staging or your prod environment. Let me show you something there. If you go back to the Docker icon there okay. and go to version selection, uh -huh. you see that basically we have version packs that's built into Docker Enterprise. So this ensures that your local environment is the same as the pre-prod or the production environment. And it's going to save us time in trying to figure out what's the difference between these two. Nice. So now that we have our app built locally, don't we need to set up a CI development loop so that once our code has been committed and pushed, our app has been built and tested in a CI system. Our built Docker images are then pushed to our container registry. Sure thing. Actually, we have that covered too. Docker Desktop Enterprise 3.0 has a tool called Docker Pipeline that makes it easy for you 
to set up an automated application pipeline. It helps you quickly create an opinionated multi-stage pipeline using already existing CI systems. It's really easy. That sounds great. How does it work? Sure. Let me show you. Okay. So basically, lots of people are struggling with setting up a pipeline in Jenkins. So what we're going to basically do is Now this, once I hit enter, will go create a multi-stage pipeline with Jenkins and a Jenkins file in your Git repo. And you see, your Jenkins file is there. Actually, you know what? I'm going to let you drive after this. Once this file's been generated, it's the same flow you as a developer are already aware of. Simply git add it, commit, and push. OK. So I'm going to make a commit. And now I'm going to just push it. Good. Ooh. See? Now, what is actually done is it's actually gone and it's created a Jenkins job for the application. Let's take a quick look at it. There you go. So we just generated that and it created it. So now it kicked off a job. It's going to take some time, and the building is going to happen. That's crazy. I can't believe how quickly we can set up an automated pipeline for our Java Spring Boot apps with Docker. Combined with the app designer and the app template, this will make it super easy for me to get productive building new apps with Docker in no time at all. That's right. Docker Enterprise 3.0 has actually made our lives a whole lot easier here. So to recap, we did three things. We actually leveraged the Docker desktop, enterprise application designer, and templates to quickly set up a new project by automatically generating all the required files to run the application. And it also enforces our organization's policies and best practices. We have a local instance of Kubernetes installed on all Mac and Windows 10 machines. And using version packs, we can also ensure that our development environment is in sync with prod and other environments. And lastly, we also set up an automated app delivery pipeline to ensure that our app is properly built and tested in a CI system, and the images can be then pushed to the Docker Trusted Registry. And guess what? We did all this without having you gone for six weeks. So let's just wait for our build to finish. Right? Pretty cool, right? <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> all right, so while we wait for the build to finish, we saw how Docker Enterprise 3.0 help the team with the build and share phases of application delivery. Specifically, we saw how Docker Desktop Enterprise and the Docker Kubernetes service provided a zero effort install of Kubernetes on Docker Desktop Enterprise and automatically kept it in sync with the, produ with the production environment managed by a universal control plane. We also saw how the Docker Desktop Enterprise automation tools of app designer, templates, and pipelines helped the developer not familiar with Docker, get up and running and productive quickly, not just with the inner loop on the desktop, but with the outer loop with DTR as well. So speed and productivity, while still giving the developer choice of application framework and programming language. All right, the build should be finishing up. Let's see how Docker Enterprise 3.0 helps the team with the next phase of the application delivery pipeline. You've got mail. I loved that movie, and I just got an email notification from the 2000s saying that our build was successful and our app was pushed to Docker Trusted Registry. Cool. So let's log into our registry and take a look. All right, so you're still a Lannister. Sorry about that. Let's go to the repos, view details. And cool. Looks like you simply just had to do a git push and it kicked off a job, and then it signed it, and then pushed it to the Docker Trusted Registry, where it then scanned, and it's now ready to use in UCP. And as you can see now, it offers end-to-end -end support. Docker app is a first-class citizen inside Docker Trusted Registry, just like Docker images, all the way from when you signed it in the desktop and actually pushed it. It simply just worked out of the box. Nice. So now you can actually take them and simply take it and run it on UCP. Great. So now that the app has been pushed to DTR, we should be able to share this with the rest of our team really, really easily. This is just like what we do with Docker images, right? Exactly. Great. So now that I have this app up and running locally, when we share this with our colleagues in testing, I know that some of the settings aren't going to apply in our testing environment. Yeah. 
And actually, we also don't want our ops team creating new configuration files for every single config change. That's going to result in a thousand separate compose files that we have to manage. And that's where Docker app comes in handy. How so? Well, Docker app is designed to solve exactly this problem. Because basically now, you can package your application, expose a set of parameters that can be modified when the application is installed, and then share it either on Docker Hub or Docker Trusted Registry. Because if you actually think about it, for the past five years, we've been building, shipping, sharing, and deploying containers. But what we really want to work with is like a layer or an abstraction above it, which is applications. Because apps are much more than containers. Apps includes network policies, host security policies, storage volumes, layer 7 ingress rules, deployment strategies, resource constraints, and much more. For example, the application which we just spun up on your laptop, we knew that it generated a default external port of 8080. But we all know, and like you said, that's not going to be the port that we're going to be running it in test, certainly not in production, right? Yeah, exactly. So let's have a look at our application so far. So now I'm simply going to do a Docker app inspect. And basically, I'm pointing it to the same app that we just pushed through Jenkins. Great. So there you go. So now it's basically telling me where it's running on, what it's doing, what are the ports, and the default port that we actually go selected. Now, say suppose you want to think about something like, hey, what happens if I need to change the port on this? Mm -hmm. So you can simply go. So you can actually simply go back here and try And that's why we have this. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we use the same Docker app inspect, and we set the front port equals 9,000. So now when you run this, it's going to basically tell you what happens if you actually do set the port. So now you see here, it tells you like what are the changes that's going to happen. So you will know what happens when you actually run it, either in test, pre-prod, or wherever. Great. So now the external port matches our port in our testing environment. This has come in super handy. Anyone using this app will need to look under the hood to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. You can see here what images are being used, what services are going to be launched, um, what parameters can be used to override default values. I know the ops team will love this. Exactly. I can think of lots of ways to use this in our typical workflow. and can, I can make changes without having to break the app. So now it's time to move on to our application to testing environments. So for that, we first need to switch context. OK. So Docker context is actually built in, again, the Docker Enterprise Edition. So it says right now I'm actually pointing default. But we're going to be installing this onto UCP. So we can simply say, now the context is actually set to UCP. And I simply need to deploy it over there. So you see here, now what I'm doing is I'm installing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm pointing it to the app from the registry. Okay. I'm setting the front port. And I'm setting the orchestrator value to Kubernetes, because we know UCP supports both Swarm and Kubernetes. And then we wait for Khaleesi to get stable. And this is going to pull all the applications. There you go. So Khaleesi is stable up and running. So let's quickly check what else we can see over here. It will help people in the back. So now this is going to tell you all the things related to what we spun up. So it spun up the same things that you actually saw in the local environment, but it actually spun it up on UCP. So now if you actually go to UCP, which is our orchestration layer, universal control plane, 
go to applications. Ta-da! Kalishi is right there, and she's healthy, and all the resources are now deployed to UCP. And as you can see here, just like containers and services, now Docker app is also a first-class citizen in Universal Control Plane. So to recap, because we love recaps, we have, one, successfully pushed our application to DTR via our automated app delivery pipeline. Then we have viewed and modified our application parameters to support deployment of our application in different environments. And then three, we have successfully installed and run our app in UCP. I just cannot believe how quick and easy that was to set up an app delivery pipeline for Java Spring Boot apps with Docker and with no prior Docker experience at all. It's awesome. You know what? That's a good summary of the last 30 minutes in the five seconds you did it. <laughs> Great summary, and welcome to Estras. Give it up for our team. Thank you, Harish Clarissa. So we saw how Docker Enterprise 3.0 got a developer unfamiliar with Docker up and running very quickly at which point she was able to use her previous experience with Java Spring Boot to build a new cloud native application. We also saw how Docker app simplified building, sharing, and running multi-container applications. And finally, we saw how the Docker Kubernetes service on both Docker Desktop Enterprise as well as the Universal Control Plane reduced the friction between developer and operations. OK, so we saw how Docker Enterprise 3.0 helped with new cloud native applications. But our customers tell us that over 90% of their portfolio consists of existing legacy and brownfield applications. And that includes not just Linux apps, but Windows apps as well. So let's bring Harish back, but with a different developer, Elton, and see how the same Docker Enterprise 3.0 platform enables them to build, share, and run these existing applications. Welcome back, Harish, and welcome, Elton. Hey, Elton. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, Harish. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, how are you? Good, good. What are you working on these days? So I joined Stark, the uh, digital transformation program. I head up the Windows work stream. We've got this army of Windows apps that are kind of stuck in 2008, and we're going to bring them to the modern world. Oh, well, cool. Let me know whenever you need some DevOps help. You know, I can always help with that. Well, actually, that's why I'm here. So we've made really good progress Dockerizing these Windows apps, but I could use some help building out the DevOps pipelines. So can I schedule a couple of days with you next week? A couple of days? Buddy, you know how I roll. Oh, yeah. What do you need then, five days? No. <laughs> we can do this in five minutes. I got five minutes right now. Let's see what we can crank up. No way. OK, so let me open up our repo here. So we have been through and classified all our .NET apps. And basically, there's three types, Greenfield, Brownfield, and Legacy. Legacy? That sounds like old. Are we getting rid of it? No, no, people are still using those apps, but we're not adding features anymore. They're kind of in early retirement. Let me show you the architecture for what we're doing with these sorts of apps. Wait, that's it? Yeah, what's up? What is that, like a red brick block container? What exactly is that? These are monolithic apps. They are just single components. We don't want to rewrite them. We just want to bring them onto the new platform. Oh, so we're going to be moving these big old monolithic application to Windows containers, so now we can run them on the same Docker Enterprise platform and get the same benefits of portability, agility, and security as the new apps. Absolutely. So let me show you what one of the Docker files looks like for these apps. So actually, we generated this Docker file from the Windows 2008 server that's running this app in production mm -hmm. using Docker Application Converter. So I already demoed that back in Barcelona. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I heard about it. Not everybody was allowed to go to Barcelona. Was it fun? Yeah, it was great fun. So anyway, this is like a 10-year-old app. Uh, we don't have the source code. We don't have the installer anymore. It doesn't matter. Docker Application Converter pulls all the binaries and the content from the VM, and it generates this Docker file for us. And when we run this in a Windows container, it's going to be on the latest version of Windows Server. We get a massive security update, no changes to the app. Cool. So let's get it running then. OK. So you do have this Docker file, yep. and you package this as a Docker app, right? Absolutely, yeah. We want to use Docker apps for everything. So we have the same DevOps experience for all our apps, no matter how old they are. Perfect. Here, there's, uh, there's just this one service and the parameter for the port. Oh, great. 
So then we can just create a CI CD pipeline just like the same way we did with those Spring Boot app. Because that's the great thing about Docker pipeline. It not only works with Java Spring Boot apps, but with all apps. So you've logged into our build server, right? Yeah, yeah. So just the same thing. Do Docker, Docker pipeline in it. Pipeline in it. Create. Oh, okay. Oh, you see, there's a build file that's generated. Fantastic. So, oh yeah, so there's all the stages here, Docker build, Docker run, and then it pushes it to, to DTR. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Can I, is this fixed or can I edit this? Oh, no, no. This is just a template. Feel free to modify you as you see fit. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll delete the test stage because we don't have Wait, any tests. Wait, no tests? <laughs> I mean, we will be adding tests before we go to production, obviously. Yeah, sure. So now, what? Now I switch to the, uh, I switch to the build server, create a job, set up the config, point it to this pipeline. You're complicating this. Docker Pipeline did all that for you. So all you need to do now is simply commit the changes, and that's going to trigger the job for you. OK, so let's do a commit, and then a git push. And so that's our normal workflow. So that's going to trigger the job, go through this whole pipeline, build and push everything to Docker Trusted Registry. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, that's, while that's running, let's go and check out one of our Greenfield apps. So Greenfield, they're brand new projects. This is more like the sort of thing you're used to. Yes, this is more like the microservices, databases, different domains, lots of containers. Yes. Absolutely. And because this is a brand new app, we can do all the best practice stuff. So we've got a Docker file here that's using multi-stage builds. The SDK and the runtime images, they're official images on Docker Hub. Um, we're using Windows containers still because we're more confident with Windows, but actually these are cross-platform images, and we can switch to Linux containers if we want to. Oh, cool. So this is a Docker app too, yep. which means you can simply just publish and deploy the same way as we did the legacy app. Let's just repeat that. Okay, so I'm going to do a Docker pipeline init. Yep. Okay. There you go. There's my file there's for you. My build script uh, with all the stages just like before. Yep, as you see, it doesn't matter whether it's a Spring Boot on Linux or anywhere. You can do the same thing, .NET on Windows, .NET on Linux. OK, cool. So I will do the same thing. I'll do a commit, and I'll do a push, and that's going to trigger another build job. Yeah. Wait, you do have tests for this project at least, right? Yeah, yeah, we got some tests. Okay. Yeah, pretty sure we got some tests there. OK, so, um, so yeah. That's going to start it up. Good, man. See? We're, we're on, fire. on a fire. <laughs> well, those are the easy ones. Actually, it turns out most of our apps are what we're calling brownfield. So let me show you what they look like. Brownfield. Yeah. I don't see any brown here. No, no, no. So, so Brownfield means they are an old legacy application, but we are still adding features to them. So we've still got a dev team. We've still got a backlog. Oh, so it looks like a big monolithic yep. in the middle and then some containers. Absolutely. So we're keeping the original app as it is because that minimizes risk. Ah. But as we work on features, we break them out into separate new containers. Oh, that's great. So then we don't need to change this old app and go through all this regression testing. We can just add new features with new containers. Absolutely. So we've got a couple of really nice patterns for that. We use a reverse proxy in this container here, and that lets us break up the web front end. Perfect. So the proxy can then get all the traffic, and that can decide whether it needs to send it to the monolithic or to the microservices. Absolutely. And we've got a message queue container here, and the monolithic app publishes events to the queue. Oh, perfect. So whenever you need a new feature, deploy a container, and they can just subscribe to those events. Yeah, absolutely. See? So uh, yeah. You really do know things. Game of Thrones fan as well? Never seen it. What? You're a Stark. House of Stark? Arya's on a roll these days. No, no, I'm Stark, Tony Stark, Iron Man. I thought we were doing a whole Avengers thing this time. Oh, man. You Windows guys are always legacy. No. <laughs> well, I bought the t-shirt. We decided on a Game of Thrones, buddy. Okay, Let's switch on the t-shirt. Maybe I can expense that. OK, so um, let me show you. The, this is a, this brand new component. This is a REST API. So the team who are working on this, they're using .NET Core. Now, that's a new framework for them. So we haven't Dockerized it yet, because frankly, they've got enough to learn picking up the new framework. So we're going to add Docker later on. But don't wait too long. As you know, Docker is the number one most wanted platform for developers. You've got to keep them happy, buddy. Yeah, I know, I know. And we will get there. And now I know that I can use Docker Pipeline as soon as we've got the Docker file and the Docker app. Wait, actually, let me simplify it for you. You don't even need to create a Docker file. Because right from the source code, we can actually go direct and create a Docker image for you. What's this? Well, let me introduce a new thing, Docker Assemble. OK. That comes built in as well with Docker Enterprise 3.0. So let me show you. That's your Here's source, source code right there. Yeah. There is no Docker file. There is not. So simply just type Docker. Docker assemble, assemble, build, build dash. Then, well, that's going to build me an image, but how, how does that work? There's no Docker file or anything. Yep, because Docker assemble basically understands ASP.NET Core 
and Java Spring Boot apps. Okay. So it knows which images to use for the SDK and build the app and which images the app decide during the runtime. So it just makes the decisions for us. Fantastic. So we get a best practice Docker image without having to write and maintain a Docker file. Hey, and so I can use Docker pipeline here, and I can just hack the build script and replace the Docker build commands with Docker assembly. Good, 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 good. But let me make it simple for you, because Docker pipeline also understands assemble. Oh. So you can simply do Docker pipeline in it. Pipeline in it. Assemble. Dash, dash, dash assemble. assemble. Oh, that's cool. it. So here's our new build script. Let's check that out. Oh, yeah. Look, we've got all the assemble stuff in here, too. So yeah. Let me commit and push this, and we shall have a whole lot of builds now. So if I flip over to our, the, the, the browser for our build server, we can see them all building. No, let me simplify that too. Pipeline already has that built in. So let's type docker pipeline job ls. Docker pipeline job ls. And that should show you all the jobs that we just created. So there you see we have the legacy, the greenfield, the Brownfield and the Khaleesi app that we just rendered before this. All this was just created right now. Fantastic. Pipeline. So let's go and check in DTR. So here are, here's one of our legacy apps. Check the activity. Oh, they, that's just been pushed. That's fantastic. So these are ready to deploy as apps now. Exactly. Because we already have Windows nodes in our Docker Enterprise cluster. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, cool. So we can run these as Docker apps in Windows containers in Swarm or Kubernetes. That's awesome. Exactly. See, I told you. That was a very useful five minutes. So basically, we use Docker Pipeline to create the CI CD jobs for your legacy app with Docker file created from Docker application converter. Mm -hmm. For the Greenfield apps, we created multi-stage cross-platform builds. And then finally, for Brownfield apps, we use Docker Assemble. Very cool. And all those tools are in Docker Enterprise 3.0. Exactly. One platform, one set of tools, one process for all our apps, old, new, Java, .NET, Linux, and Windows. That's right. It's like all the houses just came together. Hey, you OK, man? Yeah, it, it's just having all these applications on one platform just got me too emotional. Let's get you out of here. Let's give it up for our demo team. We saw how across all three of the demos, how the same Docker Enterprise 3.0 platform enables speed, choice, and security in building, shipping, and running any application across the entire application portfolio, from existing, legacy, and brownfield monoliths, all the way to new cloud-native microservices. And so now we're going to take a quick look at the new functionality in Docker Enterprise 3.0 that we saw showcased in the demos. So first up, Docker Desktop Enterprise, everything a developer needs to get productive on Docker quickly, to support developer choice, it's interoperable with any IDE, any programming language, any application framework. To enable devs to focus on building great applications and not on managing infrastructure, we stand up with zero effort, Dockers and Kubernetes. To enable rapid time to Docker and get them productive quickly, Docker Desktop Enterprise includes automation tools to automatically build the Docker files, the Docker Compose files, and the CI pipelines that help build both inner and outer loop workflows. And of course, we want to enable this speed and enable this choice safely. And so Docker Desktop Enterprise is centrally managed and secured by the desktop IT organization. Next up, the Docker Kubernetes service, DKS, provides consistency across the entire application pipeline while simplifying managing and securing Kubernetes. To ensure the local development environment is consistent with the production environment, Docker Kubernetes Service provides a full Kubernetes stack on Docker Desktop Enterprise, as well as on Universal Control Plane. To meet devs where they are and take advantage of their investments and skills in Docker Compose, Docker Kubernetes Service runs not only Kubernetes YAML and Helm charts, but also Docker Compose without any changes. And of course, as speed and choice aren't valuable if it's not secure, the Docker Kubernetes service is integrated with the Docker Enterprise platform authentication, application security, and compliance assessment models. Now, shout out here to our partner, Tigera, who worked with us to partner and provide a Kubernetes networking stack not only for Linux, but for Windows as well. And on top of that, they offer Tigera Secure Enterprise Edition, 
for another layer of network security. And finally, Kubernetes extensive configurability is a huge source of its power, but can also be a source of complexity. We've heard from many users their request to help them manage and secure that upfront, out of the box, as well as on day two. And so with that, we've integrated Docker Enterprise's day one and day two management tools to help automatically install, configure, secure with sensible defaults, not just out of the box on day one, but on day two as well. Next up, Docker applications. Simplifies building, sharing, and running multi-container applications across the entire app delivery pipeline. Docker applications simplifies the packaging and distribution by creating a single immutable container of containers that has everything a multi-container application needs. It has a description of the application as well as resource dependencies. It has references to the containers that make up that application as well as the application's environment variables. Now, to ensure choice and portability, Docker Applications is based on the CNAB, the Cloud Native Application Bundle open standard, announced by Docker and Microsoft and being worked on by a half dozen other industry uh, leaders that will soon be contributed to a go open governance body. To leverage investments that the organization has made in Docker Compose and other future ways of describing an application, Docker Applications supports Docker Compose files, Kubernetes YAML, Helm charts, and whatever is to come next. And of course, to reduce the friction of these multi-container apps as they move through the pipeline, Docker Applications allows the application variables to be externalized and changed depending on the deployment environment without having to go in and change the application itself. And lastly, Docker Enterprise as a service. We didn't see this in the demo, but it's an exciting new capability of Docker Enterprise 3.0 that gives the customers the option of consuming Docker Enterprise 3.0 as a service instead of packaged software. It allows your operations teams to focus on differentiating your business and allow the service to fully manage the day one and day two operations. Everything from install to configure to backup, restore, patch, so on and so forth. And it's able to do so without, com without compromising choice. You can consume Docker Enterprise as a service either on-prem or in a public cloud or in a hybrid deployment across both on-prem and public cloud. And of course, with the seasonal or dynamic nature of our customers' business, they don't want a static, fixed service. They want something they can consume on-demand. So we provide on-demand provisioning and scaling as well as usage-based pricing. Now, to bring this quickly to market and scale, we're working with our partner ecosystem to do so, and we're very pleased to share that Capgemini is our launch partner for Docker Enterprise as a Service. Thank you, Capgemini. So, Docker Desktop Enterprise, Docker Kubernetes as a Service, Docker Applications, Docker Enterprise as a Service, all together in Docker Enterprise 3.0 give organizations speed, choice, and security in building, sharing, and running any application anywhere. Who wants to give it a try? Raise your hand if you want to give it a try. All right. So go here to this URL, sign up for the beta. You'll be notified when the beta is available later this quarter. We know you're going to have a great experience with Docker Enterprise 3.0, building great applications. We can't wait to hear your feedback. Now, when it comes to adopting Docker Enterprise to enable digital transformation initiatives, we get a lot of questions from our customers. Questions like, how do I integrate Docker Enterprise with my existing IT investments, my existing governance model, my existing security procedures? How can I best deploy and operationalize Docker Enterprise and enable my team to quickly get up and running and hit their objectives? How can I show success internally really quickly, not only to scale my project faster, but to get other projects on board the platform and so that they can see the benefits of this as well? What partners have integrated Docker Enterprise with their own workflows, their own tool chains, their own processes that can help me get up and running and achieving my outcomes? And we love this one. They say, Docker, I don't want to move two apps or three apps. I want to move 
100 apps, 1,000 apps, 5,000 apps. How can I do this in a scalable, repeatable, automatable fashion? So in answering these questions, we bring to bear more than five years of experience working with the community, working with customers, and with over 760 enterprise customers in production across Linux and Windows, ASP.NET apps, Java apps, Golang, Python, on-premise, public cloud, hybrid cloud. We've productized all this experience into solution bundles consisting of three major elements. First up, of course, is the platform, Docker Enterprise itself. Second up is a collection of automated automation tools and certified partner stacks that are specific to the customer workload that we're helping them with. And third, professional services and training, again, geared very specific to the customer workload and the business outcome they're trying to achieve. I want to double click on the partner piece for a second because we could not succeed with these solutions without our rich ecosystem of broad and deep partners across all aspects of solution delivery, whether it's on-premise delivery of the solutions it sells through services, whether it's certified application stacks on Docker Hub, whether it's certified infrastructure, both on-prem and in the cloud, or plugins for logging, networking, monitoring, storage, authentication, and on and on and on. So it's these three elements, platform, tools, and services that are tightly integrated into prescriptive bundles to deliver specific business outcomes for customers. Now, some of you are aware of the first solution we launched a little more than a year ago called Modernized Traditional Applications. It enabled customers to take their existing legacy and brownfield applications, dockerize them, deploy and manage them on Docker Enterprise, and thereby ship faster, migrate them to the cloud quickly, or deploy to hybrid cloud environments, and to do so securely. Now, based on the success of that, we're pleased to share today that we're updating the program to focus on two specific existing workloads. One, legacy, the other, brownfield. Legacy being those applications that are not under active development, but the customer is still getting value from them. And in this case, they may want to move them to a public cloud. They might want to replatform the legacy OS from underneath the application, but keep it running. because It's still delivering value to the business. In the case of Brownfield, it's an application that's under active development, but the customer wants to benefit from the Docker Enterprise platform to make updates faster, to make the applications portable, to make them secure as they go off to hybrid cloud deployments. Now, to these two offerings, we're really pleased to announce this morning a third offering called Accelerate Greenfield. This is for those organizations that are taking a container-first approach to new application development. That new application could be a new LAMP stack app, or it could be a new cloud-native microservice. The Accelerate Greenfield solution gives your team development productivity and application delivery speed without constraining your developers to a specific application framework or a specific programming language. Now, since the launch of MTA, we've seen some wonderful results from customers that they've shared with us. I'll highlight a couple of them here. First off, we're seeing them able to ship faster as measured by they're able to update their apps much more frequently, on average 13 times more frequently. We hear stories where they've taken their app updates down from once every six months to several times a day. They benefit from the, from the choice that it gives their developers in terms of what goes in the container, but also for their sysadmins in terms of where they deploy that container, on-prem, cloud, or hybrid cloud. And finally, they get security built in end-to-end -end at our multi-layered security approach, and it also manifests itself in their being able to remediate problems, patch applications, 90% reduction in the time it takes to do that. All right, so let's have a look at an actual customer and their journey. Oh, I missed this. They're able to do all of this with 40% less infrastructure. Fewer VMs, fewer operating systems, fewer server nodes. All right, so let's have a look at an actual customer. Visa, global leader in financial services. 3.3 billion cards used worldwide. 
dominating the market at 50% of the global card payment market. Ranked number 161 on the Fortune 500. But even with this leadership, even with this leadership, Visa wants to move faster. They want to respond to changes in their demand more rapidly. And so before Docker Enterprise, they shared with us it was taking them minutes to spin up additional application capacity, minutes to spin up a VM to take more traffic. And you might think, well, you know, minutes, you certainly can wait a minute. Well, you see this other stat? At 65,000 simultaneous transactions per second, a minute is a long time. So we worked with them to deploy Docker Enterprise, and we modernized a Brownfield Java e-commerce application, deployed it onto Swarm through Docker Enterprise, and we saw their ability to respond to changes in their market, respond to changes in demand, drop from minutes to microseconds. That dramatic impact to the business outcome drove three more groups to raise their hands and say, I want that. I want that for my business, for my applications. So three more Brownfield Java applications came onto the platform. Saw similar results. And so now, Visa is taking a container-first approach to all applications. And they're launching a new Greenfield application initiative that's targeting Kubernetes, also on Docker Enterprise. And so, you can see that together, Visa and Docker Enterprise have been able to give phenomenal results to Visa's business. They've been able to respond to their markets in microseconds instead of minutes. They've compressed their time to deliver new applications to their customers, to their business partners. And they're able to do so in an end-to-end -end secure environment. In addition, they saw that Docker, able, Docker or Enterprise give them tremendous improvements in scalability. How big? So last year's Cyber Monday, 2018, Visa processed, processed 108 million transactions in a single day on Docker Enterprise. One of the world's leaders in transaction processing, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, the Visa team. Phenomenal job. So to learn more about Visa and their journey with Docker Enterprise, please see their talk today, Kubernetes Best Practices at Visa at 5.30 today. I know you'll enjoy to hear more what they have to say. All right, so Visa's journey is incredibly exciting. And with Docker Enterprise 3.0 and the expanded enterprise solution offerings, we're making it possible for all organizations to embark on successful digital transformation journeys like Visa. Through bringing speed, choice, security to their application delivery pipelines, for building, sharing, and running any application, anywhere. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Please join me welcoming Steve back, st back on stage. Thanks, Scott. Thank you to my team. I've got an incredible team, and, and uh, I'm one lucky guy to get to work with them. Look, you've just seen how we're innovating on our platform to allow you to build any type of, type of application and run it anywhere you like. Now, running applications takes on a whole new meaning when you think about the edge, right? Phones are just the beginning of the edge. Phones are measured in the billions. Edge sensors and, the device and, and edge devices will be measured in the trillions. And by the way, the edge is not just going to be connected to the data center. It's going to be its own center of compute. Simply, I mean, just imagine a... AR or VR device that's integrated with sensors and a scalpel that are interacting in real time with the most recent surgical procedures, say for spinal surgery, securely delivered to the HoloLens and guides that doctor's surgery. How long before that surgery is robotic with software and content that's updated from procedure to procedure? The opportunities that are enabled by Edge are limitless to help bring about these innovations, to help bring about these opportunities. Last week, 
Docker, and Arm announced a partnership to deliver a unified platform for cloud, edge, and IoT. We're building new functionality into Docker Desktop, as well as an optimized engine for ARM chipsets. Here's what's cool about that. Docker developers, overnight, you can be developers for ARM. That's cool. That, we're pumped and excited about that. You're going to be able to take advantage of new services, like AWS's A1 Compute, which is dramatically cheaper than x86 compute services. And you can leverage that overnight simply by using Docker Desktop. Look, we're really excited about what this means for you. And to talk a little bit more about this, I want to welcome to the stage ARM's Vice President of Infrastructure, Mohammed Awad. Mohammed? Nice to see you. Thanks, Steve. Mohammed, um, obviously, we're really excited about the partnership. Um, tell us a little bit about what you think the partnership means for not just ARM, but for developers and the ability to drive innovation. Yeah, thanks, Steve. We, you know, this is, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having us. You know, this is a huge deal. We are so excited about this. This is not only about, you know, all those Docker developers that can instantly use ARM. It's about the millions of ARM developers that can now leverage Docker right, for cloud-native development, something they haven't been able to do before. ARM has a really unique perspective on this stuff. You know, we, we have uh, technology which spans uh, the edge all the way, embedded, and, uh, embedded IoT endpoints through the edge all the way into the, to the core data center and the cloud data center, and that technology um, goes all the way through there to the tune of about 130 billion processors which have shipped with ARM technology today. Wow. Within the next... Uh, two years by the end of 2020, we think that number is going to grow to 200 billion. By the end of 2020? By the end of 2020. That's, wow. that's, that's what, we, un, that's, wow. that's what we, uh, we expect. So when we think about this, we think about it from that embedded IoT endpoint all the way into the core data center, and we think about it in terms of a trillion devices. What happens when we get to a trillion devices? It's clear to us that data is just going to be more than the current infrastructure can support. Yeah. Um, the legacy architecture is just not scalable. You know, this idea of all of the data moving back to some central general purpose legacy CPU that's going to process all that data just doesn't work. Not going to happen. Compute has to happen where it needs to happen, when it needs to happen. Each node is going to have to filter, react, and analyze data through and through. And that's why, you know, uh, last year we announced our Neoverse platform. Yep. So, you know, th this, this, uh, you know, this idea of distributed and heterogeneous com compute it works really well, but there's one problem. Developers don't want to have to worry about the underlying hardware complexity. And that's why this partnership with Docker is so impressive, because now, all of a sudden, we have these millions of developers that can leverage all those devices and go off and build, easily port their devices, easily deploy their devices. Yeah, that's incredible. In fact, I would tell you, this is the part that most excites us. How do you take two million developers who are using Docker Desktop and enable them to build for the ARM environment? So look, I know there's a lot of uh, folks in the audience who I think they were briefed, the Docker captains were briefed on this, and I heard the, the feedback was fantastic. There's also a lot of people who want to learn how they can dig in. Yeah. How do we do that? Well, we're going to be showing it off at our, our booth. You know, we're going to be showing off all sorts of things. They can use you know, um, endpoints. They can use Marvell servers. They can use Ampere servers. They can use A1 instances. But I did put a sticker up, so I'm thinking we do a live demo. Let's do it. Excellent. Right. We get our demo team out here? Hey, how are you doing? I'm Zach, the new dev guy. Hey, good to meet you. I'm Veronica. I'm an ops. Cool. What does ops really mean nowadays? Well, I've dockerized all of our backend services, so mainly, to, mainly it's about making sure our pipelines are running and we have enough capacity in our AWS cluster. Sounds smooth. Can you show me the Docker stuff for the telemetry service? That's where I'll be starting. Sure. That's a Java service. I'll get the repo URL for you. Great. I'll start installing Java. Which version? 8, 11, 13? GRE or JDK? Oracle Java or OpenJDK? You actually don't need any of that. We're using multi-stage Docker files, so everything gets built inside of the containers. All the build tools are in the Docker images themselves. Nice. 
So the repo is called telemetry service. Go ahead and clone that. Okay. Telemetry service. Mm -hmm. Get clone. Okay. Got so it. now go ahead and cd into that directory and run docker compose up. There you go. It'll start building the service and then start, start it running locally. I think there's a stats endpoint in the readme. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Wow. That saved me about two days of setup time. You know, I saw something like this at a DockerCon demo, but I didn't know people did it for real. Yeah, it's pretty standard for us, nothing special. But maybe when you look around, you can find some way to improve the performance by around 100%. Well, it's my first day, but I can try. <laughs> Just joking. We've had a huge spike in users lately, and I'm trying to find a way to double our service capacity without spending twice as much on servers. OK. Well, in that case, maybe I can help. We're running on AWS, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. And the telemetry service is a Java application that's built from the official OpenJDK images on Docker Hub? Yeah, where are you going with this? Have you heard of the new A1 cloud instances on AWS? They use ARM CPUs. Like Raspberry Pis in the cloud? <laughs> no. These are 64-bit high-performance CPUs designed by ARM and built into data center-grade machines by Amazon just for AWS. They're perfect for web workloads like ours, and they run so efficiently that they're much cheaper than other EC2 instances. If we move all of our web apps to A1, we could save 45% on our cloud bill. Whoa, so we could spin up a cluster of A1 machines twice the size of our cluster and double our capacity? For not much more than we're paying now. That's pretty awesome, but how do we even do that? We need to get ourselves a bunch of ARM machines we can use as build servers. No, there's a new Docker feature that lets you build ARM Docker images on your ordinary Intel machines. Mm, that's not possible. There are different CPU architectures. You need to compile code on the CPU where it's going to run. Either that or use emulation, and I wouldn't even know where to get started with that. Mm. No, it, I think it would have been good, but I don't think this A1 stuff is going to work for us. But wait, you can package your app to run ARM in Docker Desktop without changing anything. I saw this at my local Docker meetup. There's a preview feature that uses BuildKit. It's called BuildX. Let's see. Docker BuildX build dash dash help. And that's it, the platform flag. You can specify the platform to be Linux slash ARM64, and it will build a 64-bit ARM image from your existing Docker file. Let's give that a try here. Docker build X. We set the platform there, and? Wait, that's, that's actually it? But how does that even work? Well, all the difficult stuff is taken care of in Docker Desktop. You already did the hard work using multi-stage builds. This platform ARM64 option means that Docker uses the ARM version of the Maven image to compile the app and the ARM version of the OpenJDK image to package the app. That's amazing. So we don't need ARM machines ourselves. We don't need to build everything in the cloud. And we don't need to dig into emulation. We can use all of our existing hardware, our existing pipelines, and our existing source code. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew Docker was awesome, but this is downright magic. I guess it only works with Java, though, right? Because it can run anywhere? No. Pretty much all of the official images on Docker Hub are multi-architecture and work on ARM, too. You can do the same thing with web apps or APIs written in Python, Go, Node.js, even the latest version of .NET Core. Wow, we use all of those languages. So we can move it all to ARM. Here, why don't you push that image to DTR, and I'll spin up an A1 instance and try it out right now. Sounds good. So I can run the same command as before and add the dash dash push flag, and it will push it right to the cloud. And there we go. We can check our DTR. And there it is. Right up in the cloud, and the DTR knows that it's an ARM 64-bit image. That's so cool about Docker, how you can ship software and run it anywhere so easily. I wish we could do the same thing with the apps we have on our devices. 
Can't you do build, share, and run with the apps on the device? No, we're not running Docker on the device, so we compile on the laptop and then copy across to the board. Our workflow is more like build, plug in some wires, copy, SSH, run. It's not so slick or secure. It's actually a really old-fashioned way of doing things compared to Docker. Why can't you use Docker? Docker runs on ARM. We've just worked that out. Yeah, I suppose. Hmm. This is the GitHub for the device app, yeah? Yeah. Well, it says in the readme that there's a Docker file for the device, but it's for local development only. But it uses multi-stage builds and multi-architecture images, so it should work for ARM too. Hey, I'm going to try it out. Sounds good. I'll pull up my A1 instance, so here it is. I'm connected and I've installed Docker Enterprise. So if I run a Docker version, I should see that the platform is, in fact, Linux slash ARM64. That's pretty cool. It really is an ARM-powered server in the cloud. I'll go ahead and try and run the service. And I'll run it with the dash D flag so we don't see all the mess in the back. Run it on the right port and running the actual service. And looks like it's there, so that's good. I'll check the stats on point two, make sure that's up and running. And there it is. That's pretty awesome. That's the actual production API running in Docker on ARM in AWS. No code changes, no Docker file changes, and almost a 50% savings in running costs. That's pretty unbelievable. It sure is. And look, I've built an ARM Docker image for the client app in exactly the same way. Now we can use Docker Enterprise on the devices and use the exact same build, share, and run workflow and pipelines that we have for the services. Wait till I tell the boss that our productivity is going to go through the roof. Wait till I tell our boss that our scale is going to go through the roof, but our cloud bills will stay the same. All right. Veronica, Zach, thank you. That was awesome. I hope you see the same potential in the ARM and Docker partnership that we do. I want to encourage everyone to download the bits, dig in, have some fun with this. And to help you get started, we've got some credits from AWS that, uh, that are free that you get to use. Okay. Look, to close out our morning, I want to invite the winner of the Docker Innovation Award for digital transformation to join us on stage. Liberty Mutual knew that the, they, they had a mission and they knew what they wanted to do. What they needed was a solution to get them there quickly. I want to invite my friend Mark Cressy, who's Senior Vice President and General Manager at Liberty Mutual, to join me on stage. Mark? Friend, how are you? Steve, it's good, good to, to see, see you. you. Please. Thank you. So, by the way, how are you enjoying the new job? I like it. I like yeah. it a lot. The one I just gave you this morning. Yeah, the Mutual of Omaha CIO. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I've, I've done a little research. I think <laughs> I can handle the role. Um, look, obviously, we've had a, um, a relationship now for about four years. Um, you and I, I think, in fact, we met a couple years ago. And um, one of the things that caught my attention when we met was... Um, you made the statement that, that you think Liberty Mutual one day will be, correct me if I got it wrong, but an IoT company. Help me understand that. Help me understand the journey that Liberty Mutual, uh, the journey Liberty Mutual is on and, and why you embarked on it. Yeah, we, you know, so we've been on this journey for about five years now, um, and we've really transformed the way we've worked in IT completely, you know, from moving all of our development and infrastructure team to Agile squads to really investing in DevOps and moving uh, workload to the public cloud. We're about 25% of our total workload in the public cloud now. Wow. Uh, and you know, I, I chose the you know, need for speed sticker deliberately because that's what our customers demand of us now. They, you know, whether it's supporting the people in the claims offices or the other frontline functions or working directly with our customers, you know, we need to deliver much more rapidly. We need to demonstrate that we can work 
you know, at the speed our customers demand. So that was really what's behind our, our transformation. Look, you know, you know, insurance, you know, is a promise to our customers. We don't produce a product. We don't have, you know, something to give them other than our promise to be there when we need to be. So speed is essential. Our digital transformation is essential. And the investment in agile and DevOps and a multi-cloud platform strategy is essential for us to achieve that. So multi-cloud is a, um, in my view, you're, you're pushing um, at the front end uh, of the curve. Why a multi-cloud strategy? Multi-cloud is important for us because we're trying to give the best capabilities to our developers. In, and when we say multi-cloud, we're including our on-prem workloads as well. So we need to provide our developers the best capabilities you know, on-prem and off so they can acquire the services they need, deploy to the environments they need, and get that speed and you know, digital transformation underway. Um, you know, it's that we're working for our developers to give them the flexibility and the visibility they need. That's fantastic. And so, you know, when we started working together, uh, I think it was basically 2016 uh, time period. Where are you today with Docker? Yeah, we, so we, you know, started with in 2016, with kind of the traditional, we're going to modernize some traditional apps and try to take them to the cloud. And we proved we can do that. It's been transformational technology for us, and you guys have been a great partner. And then we've since moved on to doing, you know, containerizing COTS apps and digitizing our customer experience with Docker. So, you know, today, if you look at where we are with Docker, we've got almost 5,000 Docker images deployed. Wow. Um, you know, we've seen an increase, uh, like 150% increase year on year from last year to this year in terms of the number of containers deployed. We have over 330 production services deployed, and that's doing everything from customer interaction to, you know, our sales compensation applications. So we're really seeing scale at Liberty with Docker. You know, we're seeing hundreds of deployments every single day. You know, look, I mean, that's incredible, obviously, from a, um, a digital transformation perspective. But I'm assuming there was a, a fair bit of cultural transformation uh, that you also had to drive. Help me understand how you focused on that and, and, and what are the lessons that others can learn on how do they drive this kind of success within their business? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the our transformation, you know, we started with our people. Obviously, you know, it's a big transformation in how they're working. You know, I said we're Agile plus DevOps plus cloud. So, you know, supporting, you know, meeting them where they need to learn and transitioning them into these new tech staffs was really important to us. Um, you know, we want them to be passionate about technology and creativity, both, you know, inside of Liberty and, frankly, outside of Liberty. Um, two members of my team, Matt and Billy, took their passion for DevOps to a whole new level. You know, I, I'm really proud of the story that, you know, this, these are, you know, engineers that work in our, you know, desktop area and our cloud platform area, and they really embrace technology both inside and outside of Liberty to do some amazing things. It really shows how we're working different at Liberty. So I, I think it's best if we let Matt and Billy explain what they've done. Look, I, and, and I would love for you to introduce Matt and Billy, but a couple of things. First of all, it's amazing, um, I think, the example that, uh, that you're setting around not just the digital transformation, but the cultural leadership is important for all of our uh, customers to, to, to hear. And look, I wanted to thank you not just for, for your partnership, but also your friendship. Oh. I'm looking forward to making sure we, we, you guys are incredibly successful using our platform. Great, we really appreciate it. Do you want to invite uh, Matt and Billy to the stage? Yeah, let's have Matt and Billy come on stage. Good morning, Dr. Collins. And I love seeing people's reactions, like, uh, like oh, what do you do for fun? I'm like, oh, I build robots. Both Matt and I worked together, and uh, he came to work one day telling me he got a 3D printer off Craigslist, and I'm like, well, that's cool. What can we do with it? So we started printing some fidget spinners, different like trinkets, and we ran across this open source project called InMove, which is by a guy named Gael out of France. They have something called the Finger Starter Kit, a kit that shows you how to print a finger that you hook to a servo, and then you program it, the finger starts moving. It's kind of like this aha moment, like when you when you have something you built and then you program and you watch it move and you're like step back and you're like, wow, that's really cool. So we had this one finger moving and it inspired us to just keep going. 
What we're doing is connecting ideas from people throughout the world. Somebody's really, really good at facial recognition. You can go out there, look at the models, apply those, and kind of combine them all together. Using Docker has just been kind of a huge thing for us too, to be able to combine those ideas and bring it into one experience. We write all the, our software ourselves. It's written in ROS, Robot Operating System, using Docker containers. All of this is self-taught pretty much. And I think that's the best way to learn is, is actually to get your hands you know, into something and then, and then teach yourself. I taught myself Python, C++, soldering, electronics engineering. People always ask us like, why do we do this? Ultimately, it's a creative outlet, a way to be able to kind of write software and develop it and create ideas. Really, we're not bound by anything. Also, to see the reaction of my daughter, she's 18 months old now. She absolutely loves the robot. She'll go up, give it kisses, and it's just been really, really cool to kind of see how fascinated she is with it. You know, inspiring people just to see what anybody can do has been a really cool aspect of this whole project. Because it's so open source, anybody with a 3D printer can do the same thing. I'm building a robot, and it's kind of cool to say and, and to think about. So because we're able to use these different technologies at work and inside of work, it's becoming this fusion of work-life balances, really these, these, these experiences. And ultimately, it's really cool uh, to have Liberty here with us today to support us to tell our story. Please welcome to the stage, Matt Emster and Billy Ramey. To the demo gods. To the demo gods. One for Rosie, too. Hi, guys. I'm Matt Edminster. And I'm Billy Ramey. And we're excited to be here. After seeing the massive impact that containerizing applications has had at Liberty Mutual, I decided to go home and Google, what is Docker? And then I proceeded to teach myself. This is actually the second version of Rosie, or Rosie 2.0. I've noticed that our progression from Rosie 1.0 to 2.0 is much like an enterprise containerization journey. But more about that later. For now, Rosie, let's get started. Rosie, let's get started. Good morning, Docker Khan. My name is Rosie. I was built by Matt Edminster and Billy Ramey in their spare time. My software is written mostly in Python and I am being developed using Robot Operating System. Over 40 Docker containers work together in a microservice architecture to bring me to life. Every part of me that is white was 3D printed. The parts are available for free online. As part of an open source project called InMove. Each of these parts are designed to fit a 6 inch cubic build area so they can be printed on a home 3D printer. That way anyone can reproduce me. There are 29 hobby servos that are installed in my body and allow me to move. There is one servo for moving my mouth up and down, two organic LED screens for my eyes, and three servos for my neck, so I can look around and see who's there. There are three servos in each shoulder. Here is the first shoulder movement. This is the second one. Now you see the third. They give me a more human-like movement. But, I have only one servo, to move each elbow. That, leaves me, with one servo per wrist, and one servo for each finger. These servos are located in my forearms. They are hooked up, by the use of tendons. Cool, don't you think? Thanks, Rosie. OK. I want to take us back a bit. I grew up watching the, the Jetsons as a kid, and I envisioned that in the future, we'd all be living in the clouds with flying cars and robots as maids. Well, it's 2019, and so far, We've got flying cars, jetpacks, flat screen TVs, video phones, smartwatches, and drones. The Jetsons were on point, but where are all the robot maids? Granted, we do got the Roomba, 
But let's be real, we want a robot that can get us a drink, hence why Matt and I decided to build our own Rosie. After Matt and I came across InMove, the first open source 3D printable robot, it was the beginning of no end for us. <clears throat> that one finger soon turned into an entire arm, then connected to a body, and then before we knew it, we had printed an entire life-size humanoid robot within a year. As Matt and I build Rosie, we try to keep in mind our original goal, that one day we'd like to ask Rosie to get us a beer. We realized to accomplish this, <laughs> we would need to solve for things like object detection and facial recognition, um, as well as we're building a base to an autonomously navigate through Matt's house, so it can autonomously navigate to his house without running into the walls or running over his cats. <clears throat> so over the past few years, we've essentially rebuilt a whole new robot, Rosie 2.0, using a new 3D printer and all new hardware and software. Here's a picture of Rosie, Rosie's first road trip, bring your robot to work day, safety first. So to help inspire innovation at work, Matt and I have shared our story a few times with our coworkers. We've also been participating in the Boston Mini Makers Fair over the last two years with other fellow InMove makers. It's really cool to see Rosie interacting with kids, especially to see their reactions. It's funny, most parents are just as intrigued, if not more, than their kids. Okay, Matt's going to talk a little bit about our software stack and how Docker has changed the monolithic approach to our programming. Thank you, Matt. Docker has improved the stability of our software, so I want to take a second to talk about that. You better believe it. Oh, will you let me get a word and you always do this. Actually, I was just about to say that Docker has dramatically Can't improved the stability of my software. Freeze all motor functions. Freeze all motor functions. Perfect. Awesome. So. Let's talk a little bit about our software stack here. So we're using ROS, which stands for Robot Operating System. We're running it on top of Ubuntu. It uses a publisher and subscriber model, which is written prim primarily in Python and C++. And also, uh, we use microservices to communicate. There's three different types of micro or communication types in ROS. The first is messages, which is much like an RSS feed, where it's publisher, subscriber. There's also services, which is your typical call and response. And then there's also actions, which is a call and a response, but you can check in on it. So if I want to move the arm to 90 degrees, it takes time to get there. I can check on where the progress is at that time. So let's talk about Docker a little bit. We use a bunch of different services, uh, both cloud and stuff that runs locally on Rosie, to make Rosie come to life. Before Docker, each of these services, each of these parts of Rosie is broken down into different ROS nodes. So we have an experimental node, ear, object recognition, so on and so forth, right? Now these different services may use different versions of library. We use a lot of AI and machine learning, so TensorFlow is very heavily used on Rosie. What that means is a lot of these different things use different versions. So all this is running on one gaming machine that's sitting underneath Rosie right now, and that makes library management really, really tricky. Also, we have really bit long build and startup times. It takes about two and a half hours to build Rosie software from scratch. It takes about two minutes for her to start up from scratch. And we have manual setup times in the week. So when I transition from a laptop to a desktop with a GPU to get some more advantages out of the machine learning, I, it took weeks to get from place to place. Now after Docker, each one of these nodes becomes its own Docker container. So the libraries are stored in the Docker file with the different ROS nodes. That makes library management really, really easy. Next, I'm also going to take one node out while the robot's running, rebuild it, and send it right back in to Rosie so I don't have to start up and shut down every single time that uh, we want to change some code to test something. So we're able to build um, and deploy very quickly. And last, one button robot deployments are very cool. In the past, we didn't think we could contribute this back to the open source community due to the complexity of how to install that stuff. And now we feel like we're in a position where we can start contributing back because we can deploy it with a Docker image in a contained environment. But I think that's enough talking about Rosie. Let's show you what she can do. Resume. Rosie, do you see Billy? Do you see Billy? Following Billy. 
What do you know about Billy? I believe that Billy is a male around the age of 34. He was born in June, which makes him a cancer. I first met Billy on July 12, 2017. His hobbies include snowboarding, 3D printing, and building robots. All right, let's see if, uh, Rosie, can you copy my hand movements? Rosie, could you copy Billy's hand movements? So it's using cool. an open source product called OpenPose to track all the skeletons and is able to kind of figure out where all the different fingers are as part of that. Hey, Billy, I also taught Rosie how to answer about a thousand different questions about Docker. Why don't you give it a try? All right, uh, Rosie, can you run window, uh, Docker on Windows? Rosie, can you run Docker on Windows? You can run both Linux and Windows programs and executables in Docker containers. The Docker platform runs natively on Linux, on x86-64, ARM and many other CPU architectures, and on Windows, x86-64. Docker Incorporated builds products that let you build and run containers on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. I hope we inspired you today. The coolest part about Rosie for me is that she's just a physical manifestation of the code that I can write. I can actually see it coming to life in the physical world. As Billy mentioned earlier, this all started by us having the idea of Rosie getting us a drink out of the fridge and bringing it to us. But it's grown to so much more. The Move project, one of the key foundations of it is that it's low cost, so more people can get it into their hands as a robotic development platform. But they rely on servo motors that are typically used in remote control helicopters and airplanes. While this is low cost, so it allows people to get more of this technology in their hands, they lack some of the accuracy and feedback that most robots have, commercial robots. And these are also 3D printed robots, so no two robots are really ever the same. Billy and I are currently developing machine learning capabilities to help calibrate the InMove so that people can do more things like grab um, and, and different things like that. If successful, we hope that the portability of Docker will help us provide uh, this to the InMove community. Just think about that. There's thousands of people who are building in moves. The possibilities are endless. Billy, I think we have time for one more demo. What do you think we should do? I don't know. Can she play any games? I don't know. Oh, Ken? Billy, how easily you forget. You must know I can play rock, paper, scissors. Based oh, yeah. on my calculations, I win more often than I lose against you. Ouch. <laughs> don't you talk, Matt. I win 92.99% .99 of the time against you. Neither of you is a worthy opponent. No. Is there oh. anyone else here that has rock, paper, oh. scissors skills? Oh. Then we got somebody here. Rosie, could Rosie, you make the how video are you? a little bigger for this? <laughs> Rosie, could you make the video a little bigger? Hey, we take a picture with all of the opponents, Steve. We can take a Let's quick picture. Rosie, could you take our picture? I would be happy to take your picture. Ready. Three, two, one. <laughs> All right. You ready? I'm ready. All right, Rosie. Let's see what you got. Come on, bring it. Let's go. All right, Rosie. Let's <laughs> see what you got. Let's play rock. Paper, scissors. We will play the best out of three. The score is zero to zero. Ready, rock. Paper. Scissors. Shoot. I have rock. You have rock. We have tied. The score is zero to zero. Ready, rock. <laughs> Paper. Scissors. Shoot. I have paper. You have scissors. Mm. Scissors beats paper. Hold it across you the win. Body. You're good. Let's try that again. The score is bit. zero to one. You are winning. Ready. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Shoot. I have paper. You have scissors. Uh -huh. Scissors beats paper. You win. Congrats. You won. Good game. <laughs> we'll count it. Good game. <laughs> Hey guys, that's all we have time for today. We really appreciate hanging out that with us. Awesome.
Thanks. Hey, Liberty Mutual is hiring, so if you want to come work with us, there's a QR code. Um, we'll also have Rosie at the Liberty Mutual booth in the Expo Center later this afternoon and tomorrow, so come say hi to Billy I and Rosie. Thanks, guys. Boy, that was cool. That is the power of collaboration. That's the power of open source. And frankly, that's the power of you. Right? Thank you so much for sharing your morning with us. Look, we've got some really cool stuff tomorrow. Come in, join us uh, when Cal Day, our CTO, kicks off uh, uh, the day two sessions. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much, everybody.